Good morning. I think we might all enjoy it more if we just let Chris keep singing. What do you think? Our scripture reading, one of our scripture readings this morning, comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, starting in verse 1. There were some present at that time who told him about the Galileans who, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans even worse sinners than the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think they were worse offenders than the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit from it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let alone this year until I can dig around it and put in some additional fertilizer. Then it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of God, and it is for us today. Thanks be to God. So when I was in seminary, I had an Old Testament professor, Dr. John Hayes, who would make a joke about uh, stories or things that Jesus would say in the Bible, and he referenced it back to something called the Jesus Seminars, which took place in the 1980s. And it was a, an attempt to uncover uh, the, the actual Jesus, the authentic Jesus. Uh, some 200 professionals were gathered. They read scholarly papers, and they voted uh, on the words of Jesus, on the deeds of Jesus. Um, and one of the ways they did, took these votes were by the, the use of colored beads. Uh, there was one bead that represented, uh, yes, we believe that Jesus actually said this. There was another colored bead that, rep- that said um, it meant Uh, Jesus probably said this, but we're not 100% sure. There was a a third bead that said, that color bead said that um, if, uh, that Jesus probably uh, didn't say it, it had some bit of Jesus in there, but it's probably not Jesus. And then the fourth vote, the fourth bead uh, was black and it it stood for uh, absolutely Jesus did not say this. Um, And my professor would joke that we should have had a a fifth bead option that said, yes, we think he said this, but maybe we wish he hadn't. Uh, When I was getting ready to preach this week, I read this passage of scripture and got halfway through it. I got through the first part of this, the part before the fig tree parable. And I put it down and I was like, I don't want to preach this. Uh, Partially because, not because it, um, you know, it says anything offensive. I just don't, I, I... they don't get it on first glance. I'm one of those people, and, I, and I'm sure you are too, that when I read Scripture, I try very hard not to just take the passage of Scripture I'm reading. I like to read what's the chapter before and the chapter after, so I get the context of what is going on. I think it's a good, healthy practice for our, even our own personal uh, devotion time to understand what's going on around the passage of Scripture that we're reading. But even doing that, in this case, I didn't understand what Jesus was trying to say. And uh, I had to go back and, and had, to, had to go to some books that are uh, written by men and women much smarter than I uh, who read the Bible in its original languages and who've done all the historical studies. Um, and it turns out um, that once I understood a little bit better, uh, it did make a little sense. I don't think I like it 100%, and I'll tell you that more in a minute. But the first two stories Jesus uh, mentions in our scripture passage, he's referencing two disasters that have taken place. Uh, the first is, uh, it's rooted in history. Uh, Pilate had come in and decided to build some aqueducts. And there were those there, um, so the, some Galatians who did not like the idea of it. Didn't like the idea of the tax money going towards it. And so they were in rebellion. And in, uh, in, a, in Temple, that, th- due to some, Pilate actually did some, some sneaky stuff. He sent in some soldiers dressed as, a common, as common folks, and told them not to bring uh, swords, but to bring daggers. And when the word was given, um, the rebellion was, was uh, put down from within the crowd. And so, as you heard that in Scripture, you may have heard that the, their blood was mingled with their sacrifice, the blood of their sacrifices, because it was the, 
the rebellion was squashed right there in the temple um, while sacrifices were taking place. And Jesus says, you might think because this horrible disaster happened to these men that their sin was worse than others' sin, but don't think that because if you don't repent, uh, you too are going to die just like they died. And then he says, uh, he references another disaster, a tower that has fallen and killed 18 people. And Jesus says sort of the same thing. He wraps it up by saying, and, and you don't you think that just because they died in this horrible way, their sin was worse than your sin because if you don't repent, you're going to die just as harshly as they did. I don't like it when Jesus says things like that. I like the warm and fuzzy Jesus, you know, the one that's, you know, come on, let's be the loving Jesus. I, like, I really like the Jesus in, in, the, in the parable we're going to get to in a minute. I want to use my bead to vote. I know he said this, but I wish he hadn't. It, it's because of you know, the church I grew up in, uh, my pastor used to tell stories uh, like this. He, drew, he drove this old beat-up pickup truck, and he told, one Sunday morning, I remember him telling a story about uh, picking up a guy who was hitchhiking. And he, the guy, he pulled over, and the, guy, the pastor opened the door, and the guy said, uh, the pastor said, where are you headed? And he said, oh, just about a quarter mile down the road. And the pastor said, get in, I'll take you. So the guy gets in, and the pastor gets to talking to him. They're driving, gets about a quarter mile down the road, and the pastor slows down. And the pastor says, no, you just tell me where I'm supposed to let you off because I don't want to shoot past where you're going. He said, no, no, just keep on going. Another, definitely another quarter mile down the road. The pastor says about 25 miles went by that way. He, him slowing down, and the guy saying, no, 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 just a quarter mile down the road. He's, the pastor um, said, even though he was annoyed at the end of the ride, and the man gets out and leaves, he said he felt the conviction of God telling him, you know, Charles, that's like you and me. God said to him, um, you know, all the time, you think you have it figured out, you think you know where you're going, but I patiently carry you on down the road. Another quarter mile and another quarter mile, I patiently show you my grace. And that's the, the, the kind of Jesus that I like. Um, that's the kind of Jesus that I heard preached from the pulpit. So this repent or die, um, Jesus, I, like I said, I'd like, to vote, I'd like to vote against it. But it is there, and it is truth. But there's another side of what Jesus is telling us this morning. Jesus tells the story of a, of a fig tree that has been planted. And in the story, it's been there for how many years? Three. And it has not, there's been no fruit from that fig tree. And I hate figs. Do any of y'all like figs? We had all these fig trees in my yard growing up. My mom and dad used to smush them into all sorts of gross things and put them in jars. <laughs> and I didn't like it no matter how you did it. But my mom actually the other day was here watching my kids because we had a, a, an event in downtown Birmingham and she was helping us with the children and we went to lunch afterwards before she headed home and she was telling me that um, about 10 years ago when my family used to my my wife and I lived in Orlando. We had an orange tree in our yard. My mom said, I was so jealous of that orange tree, I went and planted one. And she said, I, that thing has been in our yard for 10 years, and not one time has it produced an orange. And she said, uh, but now uh, it finally has blossoms on it this year. And she said, so I'm getting some oranges out of that tree after 10 years. So I, I was curious about that, so I had to go look it up. And it turns out the average fruit tree takes five to eight years, depending on lots of different circumstances, Five to eight years um, to produce fruit. So my mom's tree is a bit of a late bloomer, as they might say, but it's, the fruit's coming. This fig tree, I guess in the mind of uh, the landowner, is a late bloomer for sure. He said, for three years I've come out here looking to, for this fruit, and there's been no fruit. And the guy who knows a little more about how fig trees work what is it? It's not the owner that knows this. It's the guy who, who plants and tends to and nurtures the plants, the, the, the fruit trees. He says, the vineyard guy says, give me another year. I'm going to dig up around it and put some more. I, I, I subbed out uh, fertilizer for it, but the word in the actual scripture was manure. because I didn't feel like that one. For some reason, didn't really go with church, but that's what they were putting down around the, the plant. He said, give us, give us another year and come back then. And it makes me think of the preacher story from the pickup truck. Like, do you think in one year's time, if we could flip forward and then next year, the landowner came back, and because usually fruit trees don't bear fruit until five to eight years, in year four, the fruit tree still hadn't, born, hadn't 
um, you know, given any fruit, and the, uh, the vineyard owner said, Master, Master, give us one more year. I promise I'm going to dig up, take real care of this tree this year, and next year you're going to see some fruit. That to me is my experience of God. It is the sort of the, the gift, this is a parable of the, of the second chance. And, and with my God, I have needed the second chance, and I have needed the third chance, and I have needed the fourth chance. And because God loves me, and because Jesus died for me, I've gotten it. I wonder if any of you sitting here today have experienced that. The strange thing is my knee-jerk reaction a lot of the times, but when I forget about how needy I am, is when I uh, see someone else who can't quite measure up to the standards that I have set for them or, for, you know, or things I think they should be doing, how quick I am to judge and want to say, ah, ah, be like, the, be like the, the, guy, the land owner saying, nope, cut that tree down. Well, you're taking up space. I think the reminder from Scripture for me today is to allow grace to, uh, to abound to all those around me because no matter what I've done, and no matter what you've done, the Scripture tells us that nothing can remove us from the love of God. And if I were to read the other story listed in Scripture um, uh, in our order of worship this morning, it's a familiar story. So rather than read it, I'm just going to uh, paraphrase it for you. Anyone ever heard of Moses? Anyone ever read the story of the burning bush? Well, one time, for those of you who hadn't, one time... There was a guy named Moses, and he was tending to the sheep, t- tending to the flocks of his father-in-law. And as he did, he found himself on the side of a mountain and found uh, a bush to be, um, to be burning. But even though the bush was burning, the bush was not being consumed. It was God, and God spoke to him from the bush. You want to know what the bush told Moses to do? Anyone want to? Real, real question. Yes, to go to Egypt and tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. People, Moses' people at the time, Israelites were being held captive in Egypt, and God wanted them to be free. And so he was sending Moses back to free them. Now Moses' story is interesting because Moses was a, was a Hebrew who'd been raised in, as a child or a grandchild of the Pharaoh. But at this moment in life, Moses is tending um, the 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 sheep and the goats of his father-in-law. He's not even his father-in-law. This wealthy man has now found himself working for his father-in-law out in the middle of the field. How did he get there? Because one day when he was still the prince of Egypt, he was walking around. He was already a little upset. And he looked out and saw a soldier beating a Hebrew. And Moses went out there and murdered that soldier. And then in fear for what he had done, he fled into the desert. And this is how he ended up, married to a a woman whose father owned um, livestock, and he's tending to them. Moses was in desperate need of a second chance from God. Moses was in desperate need of forgiveness from God. He had taken the life of another human being. And with Moses, I always wonder this. You know, God is so amazing that he, he brought uh, Moses safely down the river. You remember the story from his birth? His, the order was for all the Hebrew boys to be murdered. And his mother put him in the basket and he floats down the river and his sister keeps watch as he floats. And then he gets to where the princess is and she draws him out of the water and names him and keeps him as her own and raises him in royalty. And if you think at that moment in the story, if Moses hadn't walked up and murdered the soldier, is it possible that in God's original plan to freedom for the Israelites, that Moses rises to prominence and power in Egypt and releases them? No need for plagues. No need for, you know, parting the rivers. It's just that easy. God, through God's own plan, allows the the politics of it to weave so that freedom is granted that way. But Moses, in his humanity, lashes out, murders that man, and ends up on the run. But God's not done with him. 
Moses is the tool by which God always intended to liberate the people, uh, the Hebrews, from Egypt. And there he was, a broken murderer, on the side of a mountain, and God speaks to him from a bush and says, go and tell my people they are free. Go speak to the most powerful man in the land and tell him that God has said, you are to let my people go. For me, when I read the story of the parable of the fig and the God who offers the second chance, the, the extra year to get it right to produce fruit, when I hear the story of Moses the murderer, the broken man on the side of the mountain who God speaks to him through the flames of a burning bush and says, you are my chosen vessel for the liberation of my people. When I hear that, I'm filled with hope, not only for myself, but for all of the world. There is nothing that you can do that will separate you from the love of God. There is absolutely nothing that I can do that would prevent God from making use of me as a vessel for his work in the world. For a while, I worked in the Episcopal Church, and it was a gorgeous uh, building. I worked there for a year as a youth minister. And right before I got there, they had constructed this massive pipe organ, took up half the space, that it was beautiful and sometimes deafening in its beauty. And those, that um, organist would get in there and she'd practice every day so that every note she played, it was, that it was beautiful and perfect. But the priest of the church at the time when the organ was consecrated, he said it's a tradition in the Episcopal church, and it may be broader than that, but he said that we don't want you to worship the, we don't want the beauty of the music to draw you to the perfection of the instrument. We don't want the beauty of the music to draw you to the perfection of the, of the musician. We want the music to draw you to God, to point to, to God, like we heard in our children's sermon earlier. And so he said, on this organ, if you were to look up at the top, when you're reading, when you're reading the, there's an inscription at the top, he said one of the words is intentionally misspelled. This is a broken instrument. For all the hundreds of thousands of dollars they'd spent on it, it was a misspelled word, intentionally misspelled, because this broken vessel um, is not God. But this broken thing can point us to God. And that's you and me. We are broken. We are not God. We cannot be perfect on our own. No matter how hard we pretend, pretend or want people to think it when we hashtag it or put it on Facebook or just send a Christmas card out with our beautiful family on it, none of our families are perfect. None of us can be. But we are all given the grace of God. Last story, I promise, and then I'll sit down. I, another story, I got another story about a pickup truck and a preacher. When I was, when I was in seminary, I worked at a summer camp um, called Camp Windshape. It's owned by Chick-fil-A. It's up in Rome, Georgia. And I, we, we, um, I was in charge of the fifth and sixth grade boys. And when the campers came in, we'd get a card in, from their parents that would tell us all sorts of things, medical needs, allergies, things they're picky about. And this one card um, said, our child is a bedwetter. And you just need to know, he is a bedwetter. He's going to probably do it every night. Well, it turned out this mother was lying. This child was not only a bedwetter, he was a standing in line at the cafeteria wetter. He was a sitting in church wetter. He wet his pants anywhere and everywhere we happened to be. And in order to preserve this child's dignity, we would quickly and quietly remove him from the other 60 students and find, I mean, for example, at camp out, we camped out, and of course, he was a sleeping bag wetter. And so we, so the next morning we get up, he comes, he's like, Mr. Lucas, I wet my pants. Okay, hang on a second. And we had brought an extra pair because we knew. So I had the other counselors hold a tarp up for him to go around the backside and change while I distracted the 50 boys by pointing out in the woods saying, hey, there's a deer out there. Y'all see that deer moving? And while he changed clothes, so they didn't even notice. That's the kind of stuff we were pulling off. So we had done all that, and it was the last night of camp, and we were waiting for the big celebration, and I'm standing up there talking to some other counselors, and he walks up and tugs on my shirt, Mr. Lucas, and I, <laughs> I already know what's, you know, yes. And I let myself, can you take me back out to my cabin and change? I said, yes, I'll take you to your cabin and change. 
I'm very irritated at this point, in case you can't tell from my retelling of the story. And he says to me, can I ride in your car? I was like, that's it? No, you're not riding in my car. You will ride in the camp pickup truck. Now go get in. And so I, I, I waited. He goes and gets in, and I go around the other side. I open the door, and he is sitting there on the little seat in his little wet pants, staring, looking so ashamed. And I hear the voice of God saying, that is you, Lucas. I pick you up every time you mess up. I pick you up and I carry you back. And you get to clean up and start all over again. All of us are like the little boy in the pickup truck who just couldn't hold it any longer. We mess up. We try so hard not to, but we mess up. But the good news, brothers and sisters, the good news today is uh, God is not done with you yet. He is not done with me yet. Because there is nothing in all of creation. There's nowhere you could go. There's nothing you could do that can separate you from the love of God. And there is nothing that you have done or will do that makes it impossible for God to partner with you in bringing life and love and liberation into this world. God has a purpose for you. God loved you. God saved you for a reason. So as you move into this week, whether you get to go lay on the beach or by a pool or you're going to be at your office or out working um, in the fields and wherever you're going to be this week, let that be your first thought. I am loved by God. And I'm standing here because God has a plan for me, a purpose for me to declare freedom and liberation to those who are like me, who find themselves in need of help, in need of saving. Amen.